welcome to the Scripture Study Project, our podcast that gives you a fresh and faithful study of the Scriptures that will renew your excitement for your own personal study and help you passionately teach what you're learning to others. I'm Krista, and I am here with... Zach. Zach. (laughs) Sounds like Eeyore tonight. Not really, though. Thanks a lot. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Um, We are excited to dig in today. We are starting into a new book. We're going to be studying in Ether chapters 1 through 5 today. It's episode 46. And here we go with our study tip. So we uh, had a discussion today in a meeting that I was in about mission prep in our ward. And uh, in this particular meeting, there was a really inspired discussion led by the spirit and uh, one of the things that we decided was at the beginning of the meeting there was an idea that we have a mission prep class in our ward at the end of the meeting we ended at this really exciting uh, idea that instead of a mission prep class let's have the young men and young women that um, are considering missions and even those that aren't be involved in some kind of active preparation for missionary service Um, whether that means going out with their ministering companions and teaching Preach My Gospel lessons in homes to their ministering families uh, or serving in other ways, preparing themselves financially, learning how to do the skills that they'll need to do on a mission. It was this very hands-on mission prep idea, and it's an awesome idea, and I'm excited to see how it it materializes in our ward. And as I thought of that, I thought of a, a kind of a teaching mantra I heard years ago that was, instead of focusing on what you're going to teach. Focus on what your students or what your children are going to do. Instead of asking yourself the question, what am I going to do today in my lesson? Or what am I going to do to teach my family? You ask, what are they going to do that's going to help them learn, not just in their minds, but in their hearts and even in their hands and their soul, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what I like about this is it shifts from focusing so much on what we're going to say and on the information or the details and it shifts to focusing on what what we're going to do to learn it so if i'm teaching my children a a a lesson in next year's come follow me curriculum of course we're going to study the scriptures and we're going to look at the story and we're going to identify doctrines and principles but the lesson isn't going to end with my testimony that the things we've just read about are true it's going to end after we've actually practiced something so the savior says We need to uh, live the higher law and love your enemies. And so we're going to have a discussion in our family about who our quote-unquote enemies are that we need to start loving. And then we're going to actually do something. We're going to write thank you cards to people that we don't like. or I don't know, whatever it comes up with. But, But the focus is going to be on actually doing something that teaches the gospel of Christ rather than just learning something or listening to something. I think this is another way to phrase this might be... um student-centered learning rather than like Mm teacher-focused. Is that right? Teacher-centered. It is really focused on preparing the students for what they're, well, you've already said it, for what they're going to do instead of thinking the whole time, what am I going to say? What am I going to be doing as the teacher? But really focused on what you want the students to be, in what ways they should be interacting. If you think about it, that's the way the Savior taught. Uh, he did teach doctrine and he did teach principle, but he almost never gave a teaching that didn't end in a very practical invitation to action because he knew that someone doesn't really learn the doctrine unless they live the doctrine. So practice it. Start practicing now. Uh, we have a month and a half, two months until we are all of us teachers whether that's uh, teaching yourself in individual study on Sunday worship services or teaching your spouse or teaching your neighbors or your friends or teaching your children. Or a calling. Or a calling, right. Uh, But in two months, all of us are going to be teachers. And so start practicing now. Not what am I going to teach, what's my lesson, but what what am I going to help someone do that helps them to learn the doctrine of Christ? Yeah, love it. All right. The book of Ether is kind of an interesting one. If you remember, there were these 24 Jaredite plates that were found in the middle of the Book of Mormon. 
King Mosiah was able to translate them, and that translation is the story of a people that lived roughly in the same place the Nephites and Lamanites do, but 2,000 years before they lived there. This group of people, the Jaredites, came from the, the Holy Land um, 2,200 years before Christ at the time when the Lord confounded the languages of the people of the Tower of Babel. So if you remember that old Bible story, that's where this story begins. They sail, these Jaredites leave that land, they sail across the ocean, they come to the Americas, and we have this 2,000 year history of them crunched down into this small book of ether that Moroni sees important enough to, um, to narrate and put here at the end of the Book of Mormon. So that's the overview to the book. What we like about this is, there are some things that we focus on in the Book of Ether, and there are some things that have kind of gone unnoticed. And we want to look at some of the unnoticed or untalked about things um, that maybe don't get as much attention, but we think have some really powerful lessons to learn, teach us. And also lead up to some of the, are critical in those more well-known parts yeah. of Ether. So we wanted to start with the confounding of the languages, and we just started talking at the beginning of our study about uh, mission language faux pas and mix-ups that we had. We, we both served in Germany, and and uh, there were some, of course, if you're learning a new language, there's some funny things that happen. I know with one that I, I never personally was involved with, but I heard rumors that this was kind of the, the joke to play on incoming missionaries, uh, to walk into a bread store and to tell a brand new missionary, hey, walk right up there and ask for some sliced bread. And the missionary says, I don't know how to ask for sliced bread. And you say, well, the word in German for slice is schneiden. And because you're asking for sliced bread, you ask for beschnittenes Brot, which isn't the word for sliced. The word for sliced is geschnittenes Brot with G-E. With B-E, it actually means circumcised. And so your young missionary walks up there and says, yes, I'd like a loaf of circumcised bread, at which they are really confused, and you laugh your head off because you know what is really funny and they don't. Which I almost think that's one of those the missionary, yeah. only a missionary. Very few that thrills was. that we can have, so that's one that happens. <laughs> and then our we, had, we were lucky enough to have a German mission president that, oh, they, they actually spoke amazing English and he learned a lot of English um, as he was mission president but oh they had some funny ones <laughs> Oliver Sutton that was my favorite one I think that he would say often that he had probably just learned as if it was a name Oliver Sutton instead of you know First all Oliver. of a sudden <laughs> oh that was my favorite I oh. wish I could think of some others because I know there were some fun ones but no, languages there's... are just I mean I remember I was so nervous about going into just just the thought of i don't know languages can be so overwhelming you feel like you're on a not just a foreign country you feel like you're not i remember waking up the first morning in germany thinking like this isn't even planet earth like this everything is different because they speak a different language everything is different yeah. and for the first what four months of my mission i couldn't understand anybody i remember being both terrified and like overwhelmingly jealous of little children that they could speak such good mm -hmm. german <laughs> like Wow, how do they do it, you know? So so here at the beginning of the story of the Jaredites, that's what happens. The Lord confounds the languages of the people who are building this Tower of Babel, and that's a whole other story for our Old Testament study when we get there. But uh, what we wanted to focus on is this confounding, because there are some things that the Lord confounds the languages between people, but what caught our attention is there are also some things in here that... Uh, approach the confounding of our discussion or our communication with God. So even though the story starts that they can't talk to each other, what we want to focus on, what is it that stops us from talking to God or hearing him talking to us? Because this story, perhaps better than almost any story in the Book of Mormon, is a great place to study interpersonal communication between us and God because it's the brother of Jared and the Lord talking back and forth on multiple occasions. And on one occasion, in chapter 2, verse 14, the brother of Jared gets chastised for three hours because that communication has broken down somewhere. And so what we want to look at is what does he do that 
uh, that, well, what does he do in verse 14 that he got in trouble for? But what does the brother of Jared do that builds up this communication between him and the Lord so that when the time comes for him to talk about some incredible things and for God to reveal some incredible things to him, they're able to do it. Which I would love to know more about the time frame on that because that break that he took apparently from receiving um, guidance and crying. Well, it says in verse 14, at the end of four years, so they've been four years in the wilderness, four years that they've left. Right. Um, and it's been four years since he's cried unto the Lord. Is Oh, so it does tell us. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is a long time. Yeah. And I've, I've often wondered, I, he's a prophet. I don't think he's gone four years without praying to God. So the chastisement isn't, mm. you haven't been talking to me or you haven't been praying to me. But you haven't been crying unto me. Which he did a lot of. I mean, we see in verse, starting in the verse 34, um, the brother of Jared did cry unto the Lord. Um, and, you know, his brother, then Jared, is telling him, cry unto the Lord again. I think he's seeing like, we need this, we need this. And then, you know, he he goes and inquires. He did cry unto the Lord again. And, you know, what does what does that I guess in Alma we talked a little about this too. That word "cry" comes up a lot when it's when we're talking about praying, and I don't know. What do you think that means? What does what do you what do you envision? I think this is kind of a good thought to. What's the difference between saying a prayer and praying, or what's even the difference between praying and crying unto the Lord? Yeah, and the, the word bro- inquire too. I think it's interesting right. they use that a lot. Like it's those are the two phrases they if use. If the brother of Jared verses. isn't being chastised. For not praying for four years, because certainly he's he's said his morning prayers, he said his dinner prayers, he prayed in church, whatever. For four years, he's been saying prayers, but he hasn't been crying unto the Lord. So what's the difference? And and as we were talking about it, one of the ideas that came up was, for me at least, is there's an emotion conveyed in the idea of crying unto the Lord. I am emotionally invested in this communication. It matters to me. Now, sadly, sometimes we cry unto the Lord when we're in desperate situations because now it really does matter to me. I think the true challenge is, can I, can I cry unto the Lord? Can I infuse my discussion with him with emotion, even when I'm not in dire straits, even when I'm not desperate for his, for his community? Can I, can I care about him and can I care about talking to him on a daily, regular basis? Well, I, like, I think that's why it's, I like the word cry because like, you said emotion. It doesn't necessarily mean negative emotions. Mm-hmm. Like You'd certainly feel like the pain when we're going through pain or when we're suffering, but then you also think there's also a lot of that. I mean, you cry into the Lord in gratitude. You cry out of excitement. Those Also sharing all of that range of emotions mm-hmm. with him when you're crying unto him. So if we want to breach the bridge between us and God, if we want to unconfound our communication with him, step one is we got to start crying unto him. There's got to be emotion. There's got to be caring in that discussion. It can't just be the morning prayer, the dinner prayer, and the evening prayer and bed. In verse 39, chapter 1, Jared did cry unto the Lord again. They wanted to know where to go. And in verse 40, um, it says, The Lord did have compassion upon him and answered his answered him. And he told them where he needed to where they needed to go and what they needed to do. And specifically the phrase um, that just stuck out to me after I read started in chapter 2 was so first chapter 1, verse 42. He says um, go at the head of the ahead of them down into the valley which is northward, and there will I meet thee. And he goes on, and then we start in verse in chapter two. And it came to pass that Jared and his brother and their families, and also the friends of Jared and his brother and their families, went down into the valley which was northward, northward. And that just stuck out to me, because they were seeking something very specific and the Lord had compassion on them and he gave it to them mm-hmm. and then they obeyed. I mean, I just, I, that, I just, that stuck out to me because it was like, oh, he, they really are doing exactly and going exactly where he tells them to go. They are obedient and the Lord sees that as we go throughout these kind of experiences that Jared is having and practicing his obedience. God speaks to him. He cries to him. God speaks. And they kind of go back and forth. And But also, God gives them direction and says, are you going to do what I'm asking you to do? Makes me think in our prayers of how often we ask God for something. Do we actually sit around or how, do we actually listen for a response 
We talked about that when we studied Enos. How often do we listen for response? But you're saying it's not just listening for the response. It's now listening and then acting on it. So it's this practical step of I cry unto the Lord. The Lord has compassion on me and answers my cries by telling me to do something. And when I do it, I am building that relationship so that the next time I cry, uh, the communication back is even clearer and my practice is even, or my obedience comes even quicker. It's and this, I mean, this is what we see exactly. I, I can't, I have to read these verses a little bit. Um, so chapter two, verse five, and it came to pass that the Lord commanded them that they should go forth into the wilderness, yea, into that quarter where there never had been man been. And it came to pass that the Lord did go before them and did talk with them as he stood in a cloud and gave directions whither they should travel. Hmm. And it came to pass they did travel in the wilderness. So here they are again having this communication and did build barges in which they did cross many waters, being directed continually by the hand of the Lord. Cool. So you kind of see that progression for him where it was kind of maybe a little rocky at first. A little formal. A little, yeah. And then here they are having continual direction because... What I would say is something that we can glean from that is when we obey, God God gives us more. Mm -hmm. He gives us more and maybe we become more familiar with how he's, he's talking to us. Well, we build up to, in chapter 3, this incredible vision that the brother of Jared has where he sees the finger of God and then sees the body of the Lord himself. And the Lord tells him, never has anyone had as much faith as you have. And I've always took that, taken that to mean that the brother of Jared had greater belief in the Lord. But just this study makes me think, I don't know if the Lord's just saying, you have greater belief in me. I think he's saying, you have proven your faith so consistently over the past however many years by crying unto me, obeying my responses, and practicing what I'm telling you over and over and over again, that I now have confidence that if I show you, you'll continue to be obedient to my word. And we always talk about faith being being action and that that really sums that up yeah. in my in my mind i guess you could say so step one if you want to unconfound your communication with god is to cry unto him step two is when he answers you've got to act you've got to do what it is that he's telling you to do number three is kind of stretched over the entirety of chapters two and three the brother of jared has three problems they get to this uh, large ocean that they need to cross and the Lord commands them to build barges. And the brother of Jared takes that command and is obedient, but he then goes back to the Lord and said, okay, we have, in essence, three problems. One, we have no way of steering these barges. Two, we don't have a way to get air in the barges. They're, they have to be tight and airtight so that they can survive the tumblings of the ocean. We have no way to get air inside of them. And three, we don't have any light. So he takes those three to the Lord, and the Lord gives him three answers. And what I like most is each answer not only is a different answer, but it comes in a different way. So first, the answer to the steering comes in chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. The Lord is speaking. He says, For behold, you shall be as a whale in the midst of the sea, for the mountain waves shall dash upon you. Nevertheless, I will bring you up again out of the depths of the sea. For the winds have gone forth out of my mouth, and also the rains and the floods have I sent forth. And behold, I prepare you against these things. So the Lord's first answer to the brother of Jared is, I will take care of it. I will do it all. You do not have to do anything. I will steer your boat for you. The second question, how are we going to get air? The Lord gives the brother of Jared specific instructions. This is verse 20. The Lord said unto the brother of Jared, Behold, thou shalt make a hole in the top and also in the bottom. And when thou shalt suffer the air, suffer for air, thou shalt unstop the hole and re receive air. And if it be so that the water come in upon thee, behold, you shall stop the hole that you may not perish in the flood. Step or response two is a little bit more prescriptive. I'm going to give you the instructions. I'm going to tell you what to do, but then you have to actually follow through and do what I'm telling you to do. The third response, I think, is the most intriguing. In verse 23, the brother of Jared says to the Lord, we don't have a way to get light. And the Lord says something that I don't know if the brother of Jared was anticipating. The Lord said unto the brother of Jared, what will ye that I should do that you may have light in your vessels? In other words, what do you want me to do? This time, the Lord's not saying, I'll do it for you. He's also not saying, let me tell you what to do. Now, he will give him some things that you can't do. You can't take fire. 
But he's not going to give the brother of Jared instructions. What he wants is the brother of Jared to propose a plan to him. He wants to the brother of Jared to do the legwork and the mental work of coming up with a plan. He wants him to own it and him to pray through it and think through it so that he can solve the problem. And so the brother of Jared does, and the story is famous. He finds these 16 stones, and he takes the stones of the Lord and says, if you'll touch these stones with your finger, they'll glow, and we can take him and cross the ocean. The Lord agrees, touches the stones. The brother of Jared sees his finger and says, Lord, I saw your finger. Show thyself unto me. And the Lord says, I will because of your faith, and we've been there. But uh, the third answer is, tell me what you want me to do. What do you think you want to do? Now, I think these answers are really helpful to us because I think sometimes, as I mentioned, the Lord's answer to us is, I've got it. I'll take care of it. Sometimes I think the Lord's answers to us are, I'm going to give you some instructions. I'm going to prompt you or through people in your life or through scriptures, I'm going to tell you to do certain things, but then you have to follow through with it. Sometimes though, I think the reason we get frustrated that we're not hearing something from the Lord is because the Lord's response is, what do you want me to do? What do you propose that should be done? I wonder if there's some of you out there listening to this that maybe feels like, yeah, that that sounds really good because it's the brother of Jared getting revelation, but I don't feel that way. I've never felt this. I've never felt any of these answers or any of these means that he has, but, um, and I certainly don't have the answer, but what I do think and what I felt as we studied these these scriptures and this story again was how often we focus on the brother of Jared seeing the hand of God. And what we don't focus on is a lot of the stuff that we just talked about, these, this practice, this process that he goes through and this communication that I really think is, is key as we, as we seek out God and seek out a relationship with him and come to understand that, I mean, as we see here, this is one man. This is one man that he's getting answers from. And look at all the different ways he was answered within this, I don't know, however long this story spans. Mm. But it takes practice and it takes patience on our end too. And I know you've heard that before. We've all heard that before. But just as we really think of this as a process and as kind of a challenge for us to cry unto the Lord and find out who God is and find out who who he is in our own lives and why why we want to seek him out. There's so many different things. I love this story. I think we can all go back and study. I mean, for me, 